B-24, also called Liberator. Long-range heavy bomber. Used during World War II by the U.S. and British Air Forces. It was designed by the Consolidated Aircraft Company, in response to a January 1939 U.S. Army Air Force requirement for a four-engine heavy bomber. The B-24 was powered by four air-cooled radial engines and had a spacious box-like fuselage slung beneath a high wing, a tricycle landing gear, and a twin tail assembly. The first prototype flew in December 1939, and, by the spring of 1941, B-24s were being delivered to the British Royal Air Force on a cash-and-carry basis. Early models of the B-24 lacked self-sealing fuel tanks and the heavy defensive armament deemed essential by the U.S. Air Force for a strategic daylight bomber. Therefore, they were used primarily to transport high-priority cargo and VIPs. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill used one as his personal transport and for anti-submarine patrols. Anti-submarine B-24s, some fitted with radar, played a major role in the Battle of the Atlantic and were instrumental in closing the Mid-Atlantic Gap, where German U-boats had previously operated with impunity. Alongside the B-29 Superfortress and the B-17 Flying Fortress, the Liberator gained a distinguished war record during its service in the European, Pacific, African, and Middle Eastern theaters. The B-24's longer range and higher bomb load capacity helped bring the Axis forces down to their knees. However, despite being the most produced American wartime aircraft, the Liberator was not as popular as its contemporaries. The media, and many airmen, preferred the B-17 Flying Fortress, which was supposedly inferior to the B-24. So, what made this destructive heavy bomber deserve an ugly duckling reputation? Ironically, the attribute that gives the Liberator its strength is also its greatest weakness. The aircraft's shoulder-mounted high aspect ratio, Davis Wing, gave it a high cruise speed, heavy bomb load, and a legendary range. However, there was a trade-off. The B-24's wing suffered a greater wing load compared to the B-17 and could not endure combat damage as much. Flak was the bane of the Liberators. Having a lower service ceiling compared to the B-17s meant that the Liberators were more likely to be targeted by Flak. With the increasing efficiency of the Germans and rapid development in radar systems, more and more Liberators were shot down from the skies. The B-24 had poor flying characteristics and was very hard to maneuver. Many pilots found it difficult to keep flying formations intact. Due to this, Liberators became the preferred targets of German fighters. Fortunately, escort fighters were later introduced to protect the slower heavy bombers from enemy fighter aircraft. Despite these flaws, the B-24 Liberator's impact on the war cannot be dismissed. Without the Liberator, the war could have gone a little differently. It was not a perfect aircraft, but it certainly did what it was made to do. The B-24 came into its own in the Pacific, where long range was at a premium and Japanese defenses were comparatively sparse. There the Liberator effectively replaced the B-17 from 1942. The B-24 also played a major role in the Mediterranean and China-Burma-India theaters. And the U.S. Navy fielded a heavily armed single-tailed variant, the PB-4Y, as a patrol bomber toward the end of the war. More than 18,000 B-24s were built between 1940 and 1945, the largest total for any U.S. aircraft. Some 10,000 by Consolidated Vultee, and the rest under license by Douglas Aircraft, North American Aviation, and the Ford Motor Company. 
Of this total, just under 1,700 went to the British. The B-24 was retired from U.S. service almost immediately after the war ended in 1945. A handful of PB-4Ys were transferred to the French Navy and saw combat in Indochina during 1953-54. Thank you so much for watching this video. To watch the story of the man behind MIGs, click here.